Uh, I'd like to introduce Tori. Uh, Tori Helwig grew up in upstate New York and attended St. Michael's as an undergrad, graduated with a degree in environmental studies and stuck around Vermont to sell and grow plants at Horsford Gardens and Nursery, where she worked for five years. She's currently a Master of Science student at, at uh, UVM. Her master's project explores social ecological systems associated with pollinator habitat enhancement and supports Burlington's bee city designation. Her favorite pollinators are bumblebees, but her passion for all native bees and honeybees has grown through the course of the project. When she's not working with plants and pollinators, she enjoys skiing, hiking, reading, cooking, and photography. And thank you so much, Tori, for being here and doing this with us tonight. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. And our other uh, presenter is Liz Thompson, the Director of Conservation Science with VLT. And I'll turn it over to you, Liz. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Tori, for being here. Uh, Tori really is the, uh, the main attraction here. I'm just going to talk a little bit at the beginning about, uh, about wildflowers in a, in a general sense and um, a little bit about structure and function of flowers and then talk about a few flowers through the seasons. And then Tori will, will really talk about how you can bring wildflowers into your yard, into your space, into your garden, and bring these beautiful things home and provide space for wildlife, for pollinators and other wildlife. Um, but I just wanna give you a little, some, some sort of um, basics about about all the many, many, many uh, wonderful native plants that occur here in Vermont that you can see in the wild and that you can um, you can appreciate in the wild and 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 have a better appreciation for them um, before thinking about bringing them home if you don't already have them at home. Um, so just here's a really um, sort of basic diagram. Uh, to, to just to just show you the structure of a mature, a typical flower. <clears throat> a typical flower um, is, is one that has sepals, uh, the green things on the outside, petals often colored, and then interior to that, uh, stamens, and, and at the top of the stamen uh, is the anther, which is where the pollen is produced. And then interior to that is the pistil, and the pistil is the place where the, the seeds are produced. So that's a fairly typical flower with both male and female parts. Um, most flowers are not typical, but this, this is the sort of basic. But here's another diagram that I wanted to show you, which shows <clears throat> another function, another uh, flower part that's really critical in this discussion, which is the nectary. <clears throat> the nectary is can be really any place in the flower, but it's usually at the base of the flower, <clears throat> usually uh, beneath the stamens and, and the pistil. And it's a place where sugary nectar is produced. And this is one of the things that attracts insects. So the things that attract insects to flowers are the nectar, the sweet sugary nectar, that is an important food source for many insects and also the pollen itself, which is an important nutrient as well. Uh, a, a very protein rich um, nutrient. And so just running through the seasons a little bit, I'll show you kind of how this works in a, in a few different cases. Um, these are not necessarily, these first few things are not necessarily flowers that you're gonna bring into your your home garden, but just to show you how these things kind of work. And this one is giant blue cohosh, an early spring wildflower. And this is just to show you that the nectary in this case, the purple things on the, on the flower are actually not petals, those are sepals, but interior to that are these sort of bulbous things that are, uh, that are actually the nectaries. That's an, a modified petal, and that's where the nectar is produced in this case. And interior to that is the, is the pollen on the anthers. And so an insect will come to that flower and visit the, the flower looking for that nectar that's being produced by that gland. 
and um, in the process will come into contact with the pollen and move the pollen from flower to flower as the, as the insect moves around. Flowers can also have information for pollinators. This is a picture of spring beauty, another one that you wouldn't necessarily bring into your garden, but um, an early spring wildflower. And you see those wonderful purple lines in the flower on the, on the petals, and then the yellow in the center of the flower. Those are called nectar guides. And so those, those features, those lines and that yellow spot in the center of the flower, which you'll see in many kinds of flowers, is, is information. It's sort of like a, a landing pad for an insect who's looking for nectar. It's just zoom right in there. That's the target. So flowers have ways of attracting insects. And this, this is an interesting case because the pollen is actually pink rather than the usual yellow. Sometimes plants have actually unpleasant odors that, that attract certain kinds of insects like red trillium, which is also called stinking benjamin or nosebleed. It's a, it, it's a plant that actually has kind of an unpleasant smell. Uh, a friend of mine recently talked about how when he was first courting his now wife, he, one, one day he went out and bought in a brought in a bouquet of red trilliums and, a couple, and about a day later she said, oh, what's that awful smell? <laughs> because they actually don't smell good at all, because they attract carrion flies. So they have a specialty, you know, a specialty mechanism for, for attracting certain insects. And then bloodroot is one that does actually does not have nectar, but it has these very attractive stamens. And insects look at that and see that, that color, that yellow color, as a signal that there might be nectar in the center of that flower. And they go there looking for that nectar and they find the pollen, but there is no nectar there. So it's a kind of a trickster plant. So all kinds of things can go on in, <clears throat> in wild flowers to, to attract insects and other organisms. Now this is a willow um, and I know Tori's gonna talk about willows in a, in a couple minutes, and, but I just wanted to introduce the idea of willows. There's more than 20 native willows that occur in Vermont um, and we tend to call them all pussy willows, but pussy willow actually refers to a particular species. And, um, but there are many, many kinds of willows and they appear early, early, early in the spring. They're one of the earliest things that you'll see. And these are in fact flowers that are beginning to form on the, on the willows. Um, the, the fuzzy stuff is actually a protective coating that keeps the flowers warm, that keeps them protected in, these, in the early spring cold. Um, but but what, what's interesting about willows is that they have separate male and female flowers and they don't have showy flowers. And it's, it's often true that plants without showy flowers and with separate male and female flowers are actually wind pollinated rather than insect pollinated. But interestingly, the willows are in fact insect pollinated and are a very, very important early spring food for, um, for insects. And just to show you what the different, uh, the male and the female flowers look like, this was a couple of, this was last year, a uh, photo that was taken in, on April 23rd. And this is the male flower beginning to, to, the stamens are beginning to show on the male catkin or the male cluster of flowers. And here's a female flower um, with this, the pistils um, beginning to show and emerge from that fuzz, same date. And this is a plant that's actually called uh, red-headed willow and uh, one of the many native willows in Vermont. And then uh, a few days later, a couple weeks later, here is the, the, male, the, the same plant with the male flowers um, really having um, almost gone by. The, the pollen mostly has been shed at this point and has been, has been moved around by insects. And there's the female flower with the pistils, the, the uh, fruits, the capsules beginning to form and, and um, with the seeds inside. So the, that's, that's a, just a couple of spring things. In the summer, right now, midsummer, we're beginning to see a number of different things flowering. One of my favorites is common milkweed. 
And uh, the milkweed has a very, very complicated flower. Uh, the, the flower is, and I'm not going to go into it, but it's just the, the structure of it is very, very complicated. And it's something that really lends itself to pollination. The insect has to get in there and really has to stick around long enough to get the very, very sweet nectar in there. Um, and while the insect is getting that sweet nectar, they're also gathering pollen and then moving it from flower to flower. That was recently, um, the background here is, uh, is Bluffside Farm, a property that we own in Newport, which I visited recently. And, and I found this field of milkweeds. And as I was visiting these milkweeds at the Bluffside Farm, um, this was just a couple days ago, I saw just so many insects moving around and enjoying and pollinating those, uh, gathering nectar and um, moving around those flowers. And so there were monarch butterflies, um, great spangled fritillary, and tiger swallowtail. These were all the things that were just, just flitting around and really enjoying these flowers. And as I walked around the property, I saw many, many other wildflowers, but these ones, all of these flowers in this picture are not native. These are all, uh, these are all plants that are lovely and beautiful, and there's one little insect there, but for the most part, I did not see insects visiting <clears throat> these flowers. So the, the, the insects, the butterflies in particular, were really enjoying the native, <clears throat> the native uh, milkweed, but not the non-native um, plants in the area. Another milkweed that, that I love is swamp milkweed, um, and that has, um, <clears throat> this is a, a clouded sulfur, I believe, the, this, the butterfly that's on here. Then going into fall, just as a preview, you're going to be seeing all kinds of amazing wildflowers, many of them in the aster family, so thin-leaf sunflower, and there's a close-up. The sunflowers and many of the asters have actually, there's an insect on that, and there are many, many flowers on this one head. So it's a really different kind of flower structure. But there you can see the, the anthers with the, with the pollen. Um, other favorites, flat-topped aster and uh, New England aster with monarchs on it. And many, many gold, there are many goldenrods. There are more than 20 native species of goldenrod in Vermont. Um, this is just one of them, rough-stemmed goldenrod. And, um, and an interesting gall that forms on rough-stemmed goldenrod and on other goldenrods as well. This is the goldenrod bunch gall. And there's an insect that makes this gall and the specific name of that insect has the scientific name of goldenrod in it. <clears throat> so it is a specific insect that is specific to goldenrods. And, and so the, the goldenrod not only provides provides food, uh, provides nectar and pollen, but also provides a home for this other insect. And another thing late in the summer will be Joe pie weed. And now I'm going to introduce Tori. Tori, it, it is, uh, Peter introduced you, um, but I just want to say it's just such a pleasure to have you here. Um, our mutual friend and colleague, Carolyn goodwin Keepner introduced us and told me that you would be the perfect person to talk about this. I'm so delighted to have um, to have met you and to be working with you. So I'm going, to, I'm going to welcome you and I'm going to stop sharing my screen and ask you to share yours now. If that looks all right to you, I'll begin by thanking you, Liz, again, um, for organizing this with me and thanking Vermont Land Trust for hosting this event and thanking all of you for joining me tonight virtually to learn more about gardening with wildflowers for pollinators and wildlife. Um, I know some of you threw in the chat um, when we began where you were from. I'd also love, um, so if you could humor me and let me know if you saw any of your favorite blooms through Liz's presentation or if you want to share some of your favorite blooms you've seen so far this season or are looking forward to seeing around Vermont pretty soon. I'm just curious to hear from you all. Um, realizing that I can't see any of that at the moment, but I will take a look later on. Um, my favorite um, is Pussy Willow or Witch Hazel, or I love that red trillium too, although I don't think I've ever tried to smell it. So perhaps that's something I'll do next spring. <laughs> um, but yeah, this opening slide also features my favorite pollinator, the bumblebee. Um, I took that in my backyard last fall on a bloom I will also feature later in my presentation. Um, 
So before I get into the thick of my presentation, I just wanted to walk through what I'd be talking about this evening. I'm going to open with a brief background on um, the categories of pollinators and common gardening practices um, that exist in the industry. Um, talk briefly about some basic habitat requirements that need to be addressed in your garden if you want to support pollinators and other wildlife, um, as well as some key principles for how you can enhance your landscape and gardens to meet these needs. I'm going to highlight a few blooms as well through spring, summer, and fall, um, provide some notes of caution about um, some plants I might mention, as well as um, one that Liz mentioned as well, um, conclude and provide just a list of resources I like to consult um, when you know, exploring landscapes and trying to design and um, plant gardens with pollinators in mind. And then I'll pass it back to Peter to um, manage the question and answer session, which is um, in a separate box from the chat. Um, just so to begin, um, we have a lot of awesome native pollinators in Vermont. I think when people think about pollinators, they often think about the honeybee, which is not actually native to our area, um, but we have a lot of awesome, beautiful bees that are um, the sweat bee, the leaf cutter bee, the mason bee, as well as the bumblebee. Um, and we have a lot of really awesome wasps, butterflies, moths, ants, beetles, and flies. There's a lot of flies that look like bees, but if you look closely, um, their anatomical structure is slightly different, um, but they all provide important services to our landscapes and gardens. And depending on what you plant or what kinds of um, habitat elements you include, you'll attract different kinds of pollinators, as Liz mentioned before. Um, and it's pretty well known that a lot of these species and categories of them are in peril. And if we really want to um, support them and help um, bring back, you know, the pollinators. Uh, we need to act in a coordinated effort um, on a large scale. And as we saw in the chat earlier, there's um, people from all over the state and our neighbor, New Hampshire. So if we um, take some action based on some of the principles I share with you today, we might be able to see some real change pretty soon. So the basic areas of life that we need to include in our landscapes if we want to support pollinators are homes, food, and places to survive the winter. Um, there's um, some native bee species that are solitary and there's some social species like the bumblebee. Um, each of them require slightly different things. Some of the solitary bees are ground nesting and like to live um, underground, um, preferably in sandy soils because it's easier to move larger particles. Um, to dig through them and create nests. Some of them will live in um, old woody debris or decaying wood, um, dead standing wood. So embracing some of these other less attractive landscape features are important for habitat. Some will live in rock walls and in the gaps and patios. Um, I also have a cat here with me who might make an appearance. <laughs> um, uh, pollinators also need food to eat, just like us, um, and enough space and different food sources to sustain healthy breeding populations. Um, and making sure that we provide food from early spring until late fall is super important for this. Um, having studied the bumblebee, you know, the queens emerge from the winter pretty hungry and they need to build um, whole colonies and nests. And a lot of our solitary bees do it all by themselves. So making sure there's enough food available to them um, all through the growing season is super important. Um, it's also important to provide habitat for them to survive our harsh Vermont winters. Um, common gardening practices have us cleaning up gardens um, in the spring and in the fall. So um, just one recommendation is to skip that um, fall cleanup and let some of the dead stalks and um, wood provide uh, habitat through the winter. Um, hollow stems in our berry plants are one option. Um, sumac is another great option as well. And then waiting in the spring until we have some consistent warm temperatures and avoid disturbing the soil um, is one option as well. And so I just wanted to provide an example of an unexpected place you might come across a pollinator. Um, on the right is a photo I took from Flickr of a leafcutter bee and they cut up pieces of plant 
debris and leaves to bring back and line their nests and lay eggs in. And on the left is a photo of my finger for scale next to their nests in some sandy soil in between the cracks of a patio. And I just saw like hundreds of them flying around a little, you know, quarter or eighth of an acre of patio space um, nesting in the little cracks. And um, if you were to walk around your property, you might find some pollinators in unexpected places as well. So this is just one example of a native bee um, in a in Charlotte, Vermont. So if you're trying to start gardening for pollinators, um, I have just some examples of flowers I've seen in some gardens uh, around the state. We have the wild columbine on the left that prefers rocky sites. One of my favorite spring blooms, um, Pensamen digitalis, which is beard tongue. Um, likes well-drained sandy soils, and then Hellenium at Kelly Way Gardens down near Woodstock, Vermont as a fall bloom. That's pretty fun. Um, but yeah, getting to know your landscape is a great place to start. And just going out and observing your land, you might be well acquainted with it. Um, there might be some more opportunities for you to learn nonetheless and release your inner nerd and really become familiar with what is blooming already. Um, seeing, you know, you might know what was blooming this spring, but going out and observing what is um, going to start blooming this summer and knowing what's in there in the fall and being able to choose plants that fill the gaps maybe where you are missing some nectar flows and pollen um, to attract pollinators and feed them as they're trying to survive the, through the seasons. Um, and familiarizing yourself where, with where you are in the landscape as a whole. So thinking about um, where you are in you know, your local community, as well as the greater um, regions around you throughout the state um, and in our neighboring states, as well as familiarizing yourself with your soils. So sometimes knowing your soil pretty well will help um, guide your choices with plants. And then ultimately choosing plants that work with the space you live in. So not trying to create some ideal garden that you want, but also working with the land that you have and the resources you have around you is um, a good step to take as well. So just knowing what's already there around you and how you can enhance and fill the gaps um, on your land is a good step to take as well. So the key principles I've kind of identified through my research project to support pollinators um, are supporting nesting habitat, um, avoid disturbing the soil, leaving leafy debris and layering your plants instead of mulching perhaps. Um, I know weeding is not everyone's favorite task, but there's other ways to um, keep down weeds besides mulching. Um, supporting overwintering habitat by delaying your spring cleanup and skipping the fall cleanup, um, providing food and forage early spring through late fall, um, planting your landscapes using um, the majority of native plant species to your area, and choosing plants with different colors, flower shapes, and sizes in masses. So if you plant in mass, it helps pollinators conserve energy and um, choosing certain colors over others will attract different pollinators. Bees see white, yellow, and purple really well, as well as ultraviolet light. And hummingbirds and um, butterflies see reds. So depending on what you plant and the colors and the shapes of them um, will attract different kinds of pollinators. Um, I just wanted to provide an example of how you can rethink um, gardening in support of pollinators and wildlife. Part of my master's project with UVM is working with some sites around Burlington and I've partnered with um, Lakeview Cemetery, a cemetery commissioner and some awesome volunteers um, in a group who I know are present today um, to design and plant a garden at the entrance of Lakeview Cemetery. So if you happen to pass through Burlington or if you live here, it's worth a look. Um, but it includes plants um, that thrive in a sand plain community. Um, the cemeteries on the shores of Lake Champlain um, in between the lake and um, the Intervale and the Winooski River Valley. So it's on some sandy soils and they're pretty well drained and it can get pretty dry up there. But we chose some plants that um, love to live in those conditions. So we worked with the site to choose plants. We have Pensamen, Digitalis, um, Minarda fistulosa, some little blue stem and some asters, um, all of which are happy there so far. Um, some like the one of the plants I'll feature um, 
momentarily likes to reseed. So we um, lay down a thin layer of um, wood chips instead of mulching so that the insects can actually get to the sandy soils and nest if they'd like to, and the plants can reseed themselves as well. And the photo on the right is just a side view. You know, it's a pretty immature garden at this point, but I tried to get a sense of how building this sand plain meadow um, will eventually um, fill in for itself and create more of a natural community landscape feel in a traditional garden space. So, some of the plants I'm about to talk about, um, I pulled from this list that the Vermont Fish and Wildlife website um, provides, which are some awesome native species that bloom throughout the seasons, um, are, most are native to Vermont, and this list is available online and will also be shared with you through the resources um, shared by Vermont Land Trust and me later on. Um, so. To begin in the spring, I've chosen two of my favorites, um, the Pussy Willow and Golden Alexanders. Um, the Pussy Willow, I was just talking about this with my grandmother actually, both of us incidentally remember this as one of the first plants we ever remembered in life, probably because it was fuzzy and fun for kids. Um, but it's just one of those early blooming plants that really gets me excited. Spring is my favorite season. Um, but it's just so nice to see this kind of life early in the spring. And I saw all kinds of pollinators all over the spring, flies and wasps and bees feeding on um, these flowers, but um, it can handle full sun or part shade, average and wet soils. It's deer and rabbit resistant and can handle urban environments as well as being salt tolerant. It's great to use in masses as a hedge or to naturalize into a landscape. Um, so if you have a wet site, or a wet spot on your property, this would be a great plant, great option for that. Um, but it's a very important, as Liz said, early spring pollinator powerhouse that I highly recommend. And there's lots of other native willow varieties um, to be found and plant as well. Golden Alexanders is a fun one I've come to love because of its um, yellow spring bloom, as well as having this really deep red fall foliage. Um, it prefers moist sites as well, um, but it hosts a lot of beneficial small native bees, as well as the swallowtail caterpillar. It's great for open woodlands and native plant gardens, prefers full sun or partial shade, average to wet soils, and is great to use in masses and meadows. Um, so these two are my picks, but there's plenty of other great spring options. Moving into summer, I've chosen the milkweeds. Um, there's lots of great reasons why they should be uh, included in your landscapes or gardens, but the for your wetter sites, the swamp milkweed on the left is a great option for some of the reasons that um, Liz mentioned, but it also serves as a food source for this awesome native pollinator, the golden digger wasp, um, which also lives in sandy soils, um, but has large pink flowers that attract a variety of pollinators like the golden digger wasp seen here. Um, it's great for moist locations and can handle average soils in full sun or partial shade. It's also deer and rabbit resistant and perfect for a rain garden. Um, it's also great for monarch caterpillars, which you see feeding on its leaves um, in the top right of my screen. And then for your drier sites, the butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa, shown here on the bottom. Um, it's not quite booming yet, but I also included this photo just as a nudge to get to know plants in all stages of life. It's kind of fun to, you know, identify foliage as well as flowers. Um, and so seeing these buds is kind of exciting um, and a good opportunity to um, expand your knowledge and plant ID skills. Um, but it's loved by hummingbirds and butterflies, has a really striking orange bloom um, that likes to reseed. Um, it's drought tolerant and deer and rabbit resistant, great in meadows, rock gardens, and in mass. Um, it was also a plant chosen for my sand plain demonstration site um, at the Lakeview Gardens earlier. Um, yeah, butterfly weed. And then moving into the fall, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about goldenrods and then my favorite late blooming aster. Um, the goldenrods, like Liz said, there's a lot of different varieties of them that can handle um, a lot of different site conditions, dry, wet. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with seeing them bloom around in the fall, but they're a big signal to beekeepers actually that 
Um, the end of the season is near. They're one of the last great nectar flows and they're great to plant in masses if you're trying to naturalize a site, maybe convert your lawn into a meadow. Um, this is a plant that will fill in fast and is a great option for that, featuring one of my favorite little um, native pollinator friend, the bumble. It is well suited for naturalized areas. You're um, not, yeah. They bloom for a really long time. Um, but I am, was really excited to talk about this fall blooming aster because it grew under a large um, old maple tree in my last apartment's backyard. And it bloomed well into November and was covered in bumblebees. Um, perhaps that was because I was in Burlington and the climate's a little warmer here than some of our um, outskirts in the mountains, but it's a, such a sparkly, lovely woodland flower that can handle a variety of sun and soil conditions. And um, it's another plant that likes to reseed, but it's well suited for a suburban yard or garden as well as more woodlandy areas. Um, I just wanted to, um, yeah, give a shout out to the woodland aster. And that was what my bumblebee was feeding on at my opening slide. And yeah, I took this photo in my backyard last year. So having said all that, I wanted to provide words of caution when gardening with some of these wildflowers. Um, the common milkweed as well as goldenrods can sp spread and fill in really quickly. Um, and if you're trying to create more of like a controlled, maintained environment, these might not be the best options. That being said, they are great options depending on your landscape. Um, just choose wisely. Um, do your research when choosing plants and really um, get to know your site and think about what you want and what would work there well. Um, I also want to provide words of caution about invasive species. Um, I don't think many places sell them, but I wouldn't buy them. Um, don't plant them. And um, as you walk around your landscapes and get to know it better, keep an eye on them if you have them. Um, they can steal the show um, instead of some of these native species that are better suited to um, our native environments and better support pollinators and other wildlife. Um, and if you come across some rare or endangered species um, out in the wild, if you have a woodland nearby, um, don't harvest them and bring them home. They're worth protecting where they are um, in place and should be admired um, in place and not necessarily brought back to your home. So um, just to conclude, I wanted to create a, like a concrete list of actions you could take starting tomorrow. Um, beginning with just getting to know your landscape, um, being observant and, and re-envisioning the space. Um, it can be a small little garden or acres of property, um, how you can engage that um, to support pollinators or other wildlife and focusing on filling the gaps in bloom time. I'm sure some of us have um, blooms at different points in the season, but creating a cohesive line of blooms from spring to fall is a great step to take delaying spring cleanup of your gardens and disturbing the soil once we have consistent warm temperatures, skipping that fall cleanup and mulching, you know, using that thin layer of wood chips or layering your plants in the landscape helps support pollinators. Um, raising the blade, mowing less during the year or just replacing your lawn altogether, as well as monitoring, keeping an eye on plant health and documenting pollinators present. There's a lot of great ways that you can support um, scientific research efforts and conservation efforts throughout the state through photos and journals that I'm sure some of you have heard of iNaturalist is a great app that will help you learn about pollinators you have present or um, some of the plants you have too. So you can support research and um, data collection, but most importantly, have fun because it's a really fun endeavor to support pollinators, but if you're an artist or you wanna explore all these different bloom shapes and colors um, and attracting pollinators, there's a lot of fun to be had in this work as well. These are some of the resources I definitely recommend consulting if you'd love to learn more about what you can do to support pollinators and wildlife. The Xerxes Society sponsors the Bee City Initiative. Um, if you haven't heard of it, campuses and cities across the country have promised to enhance pollinator habitat annually. Um, part of my project is doing that, but they have a lot of great resources and initiatives um, to consult online. Um, there's textbooks as well. The Rock Fish and Wildlife website has that plant list and other recommendations for landowners and gardeners. 
Um, Doug Tallamy has become one of my idols and is an awesome speaker and author. Um, I just read his most recent book, Nature's Best Hope, recently, which is a super easy read um, now that it's summertime and we might have more time to read. I highly recommend picking up this book if you haven't already. And Vermont Land Trust is hosting an event where he will be speaking this coming August, um, which will be shown um, in an upcoming slide. The Vermont Center for Eco Studies is collecting some awesome data. It has great um, information on native bees and bumblebees. And there's a few nurseries around Vermont and um, a great seed bank in Maine. Um, I highly recommend visiting Riverberry Farm, if not for pollinator plants, then strawberries right now. Um, Horsford has a lot of great um, plant options and um, educational resources on their website as well as some great people who would love to talk to you about insects and pollinators on site. Um, there's this great garden in Jericho and um, we are also at Vermont Land Trust and at UVM available by email after my presentation. Some of my references through my presentation today. A huge thanks from me and Vermont Land Trust. Um, I think Perhaps some of you want to write this down. Um, this might be shared in an email coming up. Yep, from Peter or Liz. And I'm going to stop sharing. But once again, thank you everybody for joining me this evening. Um, it has been a lot of fun becoming more well versed in this line of work over the past year or two. Um, I'm still learning. I definitely don't know it all, but I'm so happy to share what I do know so far and would love to take any questions you might have right now. Um, and I'll pass it back to Peter to manage that. Great, thanks. Thanks, Tori. Uh, I certainly learned a lot from your presentation that the point you made about planting in mass to save pollinators energy moving from one plant to another, I'd never thought of that. It makes perfect sense. That's great. Um, Thanks for your presentation. So uh, a quick rundown of the favorite plants that people had. Um, chicory, a couple votes for showy lady slipper. Uh, flowering raspberry, red trillium, which Liz talked about. Jack in the pulpit, clematis, uh, milkweed. Penstemon, which you mentioned a couple of times. Butterfly weed and goldenrod and asters. So a lot of the stuff that you were talking about are crowd favorites. Um, there are uh, upcoming events and the slide was up for a little while there. If you didn't get that, uh, it's really easy to find. Uh, just go to the VLT website and right up in the top left, there's a button that says events and just click on that and it'll have that whole list for you. Um, thank you so much for uh, being with us tonight. We're gonna send you uh, some follow-up resources and also a survey that'll probably take you about five minutes to fill out. It's really helpful if you do it. We read every single comment and the comments we've gotten from people have really helped us um, sort of refine our program and think about what other things we might wanna do. Liz and I are both on the events team and it's really super helpful if you can fill that survey out. So that should be coming to you soon. Um, and we are a membership organization. A lot of you are already members. Um, if you'd like to become a member, again, you can go to the VLT website and donate there. Um, let's see, we have a bunch of great questions. So uh, for you, Liz, um, on the willows, are there male and female flowers on the same plant or are they separate male and female plants? Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear, but yeah, they are separate plants. And it's a condition okay. called dioecious, which, which if you analyze that word, it means two houses, a house for the male and a house for the female. So you'll see separate plants that have the male flowers and female flowers. Great, thank you. And Nicole wanted to know, what were the non-native flowers called in the milkweed section? In the, in the slide, I had a slide with five, uh, five flowers. I could share that screen again, but, but I, only, if we run, uh, only if we have time later, perhaps. But there was St. John's wort, there was yarrow, uh, there was cow vetch, there was orange hawkweed, and there was ox eye daisy which are things that, you know, grow commonly in meadows and, 
you know, a lot of people don't even realize I didn't, you know, when I first started doing this, that those are not native plants. Um, they're not invasive either. You know, they're not invasive. They're in their, the St. John's word is a very useful plant, as you know. But, and there are native St. John's words. There's native hawkweeds. There's uh, native kinds of vetch. But um, these ones were all, are all non-native. But just, you know, just, I guess the point in that was that the insects are, are less interested in those because the insects and the plants evolved together, right, Tori, over, you know, over evolutionary time. And so, um, so for, the, for the insects that are native here, that just have not evolved with those plants that are mostly from Europe and Asia. Um, so we have a question from Kate about uh, stem nesting bees. Um, don't they need the plant to be left up year round, for instance, uh, cutting it to maybe back to eight to 20 inches, but not all the way to the ground? And she makes the point that new shoots for the season quickly cover them over. Yeah, um, I know that they um, do overwinter in the hollow stems and an interesting note in a way an invasive species could be used in a beneficial way. The Phragmite reeds are hollow stems through the winter that I know um, some native bees help them will overwinter in. Um, mm -hmm. Not all bad, I suppose, but yeah, leaving those is super important for the nation mason bee is one example of that. Um, thank you, Kate. <laughs> uh, Devin wants to know about putting uh, Pussy willows in a rain garden, would they take over, do you think? Um, is that I guess me? Either one of you can answer. Go ahead, Tori. <laughs> um, I don't think they would take over necessarily, but they do get rather large, and it depends on how um, big your rain garden is. But they are um, pretty vigorous and will search out that water with vigor. Um, Lisa says she has golden Alexander growing in her meadow. Uh, is that something she could transplant into her garden from there? Tori? Um, potentially, I don't see, they're pretty, um, they're pretty easy to reseed and um, if you dig it at the right time, you could transplant it. I know the this, this spring is a great time to do that um, fall too. And I'm sure that Lisa knows the difference between golden alexanders and poison parsnip or wild parsnip, but that's something that um, that just others should just be aware of, that that's a plant that looks to some like, they, they're, they are kind of lookalikes, um, the golden alexanders is much more delicate, earlier flowering. Right now, the golden alexanders is where I am at least mostly gone by, but the wild parsnip, the poison parsnip, a much taller plant is flowering now that also has a yellow umbel, just like the golden alexanders. So just be careful to know which one you've got. That's a great point, Liz. Thanks for that. Um, Dem wanted to know whether goldenrod and asters are trans, uh, transplantable from yard to yard, and if, the, if they are, what's the best time to do that? I... Uh, I think the spring is the way to go, um, personally. So if you're going to transplant asters and goldenrods in the spring, you want to, in the fall before, identify them, tag them so you know what they are. Because in the spring, at least to me, I find that um, those, it, it's harder to identify them and to, you know, because there's so many asters and so many goldenrods. But your favorite, Tori, the the heart-leafed one is an easy one to identify any time of year, but some of them can be tricky. So mark them in the fall, move them in the spring. Does that sound right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, somebody says they have uh, an almost vertical cliff bank in, in their yard and they'd like recommendations. It's just under full sun and they'd like to use it for pollinators. What do you think might work there? Immediately what comes to mind for me is the wild columbine. Um, you don't need much soil there. Yeah, great idea. I see that in, the, in those kinds of places out in the woods all the time. You were gonna say something, Liz? 
and the heart leaved aster sometimes grows on cliffs too. So that might be one to try as well. Um, and Deborah would like you to talk a little bit more about what you mean about layering plants versus using mulch. Yeah, so briefly um, picking, you think vertically about how plants grow. You can have ground covers that cover that initial layer, some um, mid-height plants and then taller ones that fill in all the space so that um, it's harder for unwanted plants to reseed and grow in between. Um, so you can kind of maintain the ground um, through the different vertical layers of planting. Uh, let's see. Deb says, my town's working on transitioning an unmanaged plot of land to a pollinator area, has vetch and sulfur sink foil widely spread over the area. Should we do anything to remove those or just add pollinator plants? We've already planted common milkweed and bee balm. Um, I don't have a good answer for that personally, um, but I would happily do more research for you. <laughs> Yeah, and those plants, you know, I've it, those plants aren't harmful uh, in any way. They're just not the best for attracting native pollinators. So, uh, and someone would like to know how to tell the difference between Asclepius incarnate and S. erica. I think what they might mean is uh, incarnata, which is the swamp milkweed, and Asclepius syriaca. Um, which is or syriaca, which is the common milkweed. Uh, so um, is, is what I'm guessing. Um, I think that's right. So, uh, you know, I talk to my phone sometimes and it does things like that. <laughs> that's Erica. <laughs> but but um, so the, the swamp milkweed is the flowers are a brighter pink in my experience and the leaves are narrower. The leaves are, are, are fairly narrow and, and, and a brighter green, not as, uh, not as gray green. Whereas the common milkweed, the one that we have most commonly is, has got a wider and, and a sort of blunt, blunt tipped uh, leaf and the flowers are a paler pink. They actually can be pure white. That's rare, but I've seen, I've seen clones of pure white. Uh, and it's possible that the swamp milkweed can do that as well, but it's generally a, a paler pink. Tori, would you add anything to that? Um, I noticed someone in the chat wrote the smell of the swamp milkweed. There are some pretty sweet smelling, ice cream smelling varieties out there. Um, okay. But I feel like the common milkweed also has more of like a ball shape as opposed to yeah. like open like a flat. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, Linda says, what are your thoughts about non-natives, such as Nipata, I think, uh, which are always covered with bees in my yard? And that probably is... Um, or Nipeta? Nipeta cataria. Oh. What's the common name of that? Blanking. Um, catnip? Catnip. That's it. <laughs> Um, well, I think everything in moderation, I know my mentor, Doug Talamy, would say, um, trying to maintain a ratio of 70% native species, 30% non. Um, there are non-native species that aren't necessarily invasive that um, are beneficial for pollinators. But um, in the grander scheme of the landscape and ecosystems, native species support a greater diversity of insects and wildlife. Um, more than just the bees and pollinators. Right. Um, Kathleen says she planted pussy toes last year and this year has an Ameri has American lady caterpillars on them. Only planted two plants. Will they run out of food? Should I buy more? I mean, I'm always in favor of buying more plants, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, getting that coverage and all through the all through the seasons with different blooms would be a great idea. Do you have a 
do you, do you think there's a difference between cultivated varieties and, and native plants in terms of their value? Um, there is. So one of um, the resources I cited was Annie White's dissertation. Um, she's a now lecturer at UVM, but she did research on the value of cultivars versus straight native species. Um, and in some cases, the native variety, the straight species did provide better nectar and pollen resources um, and some cultivars were just as good. So it kind of depends on the plant, but I think defaulting to the native versus the cultivar is a good um, idea, but there are some cultivars that are good too. Um, let's see, any recommendations about ground cover? Um, depends on the season, but one of my favorite spring ground cover-esque plants is um, geranium maculatum, the little pink bloom that stays pretty low. Um, I don't know, Liz, if you have any that come to mind. Um, someone would like to know if they should cut their meadow back in the fall or leave it. It's mostly goldenrod. I say leave it. <laughs> I, I say leave it unless um, until woody stuff starts really coming in. It, it's, not, it's become a forest. It'll become a forest eventually, right? Yeah. If you don't mow it um, every once in a while. Yeah, meadows are also really important fall uh, migrating bird habitat. So leaving, uh, leaving it unmowed at least through that goldenrod season and maybe even a little later is really important for birds too. So delay it as long as you can, I would say. Um, so Lauren would like to know if you have ideas on how we can incentivize nurseries and landscapers to sell more native plants. Boy, that's a big one. Um, <laughs> the Nature Conservancy tried that a few years ago. They had a whole program for people, for nurseries to sign up to sort of tout that they were selling natives. Um, I don't know, do you have ideas on that, Liz? Um, I, I guess I would, I would maybe defer to Tori. And, and one thing that we, we I, I would encourage people to do if you do see nurseries selling native plants is find out if they really are native and what, where they are native to. Um, because you sometimes see that label native and it means maybe native to North America, but maybe not even native to the Northeast. So that term doesn't have, as far as I know, and Tori, maybe you know different, but as far as I know, that term native, when it's being sold in a nursery, doesn't have an official meaning. And so you just want to do a little digging and research and asking for specifics. Definitely varies. And if you are a nerdy type like me, this is when it's great to learn Latin. So you can be super specific in what you're looking for. Um, and I feel like the more of us that are demanding these straight species um, in Latin terms might help guide um, nurseries options for selling in the future. Yeah. Now, there, um, <clears throat> there's a resource that that is not one that's sort of um, ready to really sh share officially, but I can just tell you about it and you can <clears throat> Google this, but if you Google Bernie Pocket blog, <laughs> Bernie is a neighbor of mine in Jericho and he, he has been accumulating um, information, lots of information on native plants that can be used in gardening. And um, he simply, uh, he has this vast list of all the native plants in Vermont by scientific name and um, common name. And uh, so just go Bernie Pocket, P-A-Q-U-E-T-T-E -T -T -E blog, and you'll, you'll be able to, to dig up this list. It's really helpful. Um, it's not something, like I said, that's quite ready for, anyway, yeah, go ahead and, and check that out. Right. Helpful. Kathy would like to know if you cut pussy willows, will they grow back or will it kill them? Um, depends on how far you cut them back, but willows are pretty tough. <laughs> willows are tough. Willows are tough. Yeah, that's what's so great about them. You can just shove them in the ground and they'll grow, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mary's got a great 
interesting question. She has migratory birds return year after year. What about insects? Are they returning multi-generation, multi-generational or transitory? Take bumblebees, for example. Uh, bumblebees are fun. So they, the queens who emerge in the spring will eventually lay generations of new queens that go off and create their own colonies. So they're intergenerational in a sense, but they'll stick around and overwinter um, locally as opposed to the monarch, which migrates. Uh, Nicole says she got one nasturtium seed from a farm is, and has been growing it since April. Um, she wonders when she can put it in the garden from its pot and if there are specific plants to not put it with. I'm less familiar with nasturtium, but I think you could plant it comfortably now. And you can plant them from seed in the garden if, if you don't have competition. Um, let's see, any suggestions for native plants for people with allergies? One thing that I'll just say about that is that goldenrods are not allergens. Goldenrods do not cause allergies. <clears throat> and it's common to think that they do because they flower at the same time that ragweed flowers. Ragweed is a terrible allergen. If you look at a microscope picture of its pollen, it's all spiky and it just, it gets, it just really just, you know, bothers the nasal passages. Whereas the pollen of goldenrod, which is insect, moved around by insects, not by the wind, um, is smooth and, and not an irritant. So just in case you're worried about goldenrods, they're not really a, a, a problem in that way. Um. And someone says they have a patch of common milkweed about 20 by 20 for several years and suddenly there's none that came up. Any idea why? I'm not sure. It looks like Barbara. I'm not sure where Barbara's from. She wonders if maybe it's too dry. It's hard to know without seeing the site. Don't know. Any thoughts, Tori? Uh, I think I've got a second Peter's comment of hard to know. Without yeah. seeing the sign, yeah. yeah. Um, a couple of people have uh, asked about um, the late mowing. One person's Katrina says she has a lot of grapevine and Virginia creeper and some brambles coming in, wonders um, what she should do about mowing. Um, she should do whether she should do it every couple of years. Pulling it all would be a big job. Uh, Lisa seems to think mowing the meadow in October every other year is the answer, or is an answer anyway, I should say. I say again, it depends upon your goals. You know, if you want to have a completely woody plant free meadow, you probably need to mow it more often, you know, like annually as opposed to every couple of years, if you don't mind. And the diversity, um, and Peter, you know more about this, but the diversity, you know, if you have some woody plants coming up and in, in patches even, wouldn't that be, you know, sort of nice diversity of habitat for different species? Right. Yeah, I mean, if, if you wanna get rid of those things, if they're not covering the entire field, you can mow those particular areas and leave the rest of the field. So you've still got a fair bit of habitat. Um, if you're getting uh, a lot of invasive plants that you wanna get rid of, you'll have to make a decision about what's most important, trying to control those or the habitat, whether it's worth losing the habitat for a year or two when you do some rather intensive mowing to try to get the, rid of the invasives. Uh, let's see. There's somebody who rotates mowing around the meadow. Do we anticipate any different pollinators as a result of climate change? That's a good question. Would the plants that accommodate their diet and habitat follow them? Um, I don't know that pollinators populations will change. Um, I think that's where the plant species might change. Um, as yeah, 
I don't never really thought about that. Um, but what plants you choose where might change, I guess. Yeah. One of the things that some people have talked about with, with respect to climate change is that the timing of things can be can present problems for insects and, and other, um, you know, mutualisms, plants and animals that depend upon each other. Um, you know, if plants are flowering earlier in the spring and, and the insects are not emerging earlier in the spring, that can create problems. So there are some things that are being noticed and noted. So we're about a minute over. We've got one question left. If it's okay with you two, we'll answer that and then sign off. Is that good? Sure. Okay. Um, so uh, if we wanted to turn a small strip of yard near the house into a wildflower garden, is there a resource that would be beneficial in helping me do that? I think one thing that someone put in the chat, you could look for... Um, there's a great native plant resource, uh, gobotanynativeplanttrust.org. That's a great website. So you yes. can check that out. Um, Tori and Liz, do you have other uh, recommendations for them on how to get that started? One thing, is, it, the Native Plant Trust is great. Another thing, you know, like a really, like for the lazy person like me, just let it go. See what happens. I mean, truly, a lot, a lot can happen with just neglect. Great. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us tonight. Uh, you will be getting a follow-up email with the survey, so watch your inbox for that. Uh, we did record this. It's still recording. Uh, we will have that edited and put up on our YouTube channel uh, within a week. So have a look on our website if you... Uh, go to vlt.org and scroll all the way to the bottom of the page. There's a little YouTube icon. Just click on that and you'll see all the recorded webinars we've done. So thank you again, Tori, so much. And Liz, for this, this was really great. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Tori. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you all. It's great to see you. Bye-bye.